And so I think we're just about ready to begin, Louis. So Lemmy and Alejandro, I'm going to invite you to just turn off your cameras and I'll turn mine off as well. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to hand over to Luis. Go ahead, Luis. Okay, thanks, Mark. Good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to be here to share my top 10 tips for developing students' global skills. Before going into the tips themselves, I think it would be important, I think it would be a good thing to establish what we mean by global skills. Broadly speaking, they're skills that enable us to operate in a global context. However, to break that down further, we can draw on different frameworks, such as the UNESCO Four Pillars Framework, Learning to Know, Learning to Do, Learning to Live Together, Learning to Be, or the Framework for 21st Century Learning, which includes ways of thinking, tools for working, ways of working, ways of living in the world. But all of these frameworks have key areas in common. And I think that my fellow teacher trainer, who's not here this evening, John Croft, in his Q&A webinar, advancing students' global skills, synthesized very well the global skills into five main categories. Communication and collaboration, creativity and critical thinking, intercultural competence citizenship, also referred to as global citizenship, emotional self-regulation and well-being, and digital literacy. So here goes. Tip number one would be investigate and be clear about what global skills and their sub skills are. I think it's difficult, isn't it, to teach something that you yourself are not clear about. Some basic research and referencing work is necessary to provide a clear understanding and context for teaching global skills and the sub skills. I mentioned earlier, looking at existing global skills frameworks out there that are online and which are being used by different countries to frame their educational programs. But also, and definitely, I think, more directly through your course books. Many course books have global skills and the sub skills integrated into their syllabus and provide answers to what the skills are and how to go about teaching them. Macmillan course books, for example, uh, for example, Academy Stars, Give Me Five. I saw that there was a teacher from Spain earlier. The version in Spain is called New High Five, Global Stage, all of which are for primary, Gateway to the World, or Great Thinkers, if you're teaching in Spain, which are for secondary, and Language Hub or Macmillan English Hub, which is also a version for Spain, and Skillful, both of which are courses for adults, all provide very detailed and clear information on what these skills are in the teacher's guides. And because there are global skills frameworks out there to reference, and these skills are already integrated into many course books nowadays, such as the ones I've just mentioned, you have somewhere to start. You're not starting from scratch. So my second tip is don't reinvent the wheel. The teacher's books provide detailed information on the skills and the sub skills and guidance on how to teach these skills in an integrated way through the lessons and units of these courses. You don't need to revolutionize your teaching. These skills can sit naturally alongside the teaching of language skills. And having an integrated approach to your English language course, where language and global skills coexist and complement each other through practical engaging and motivating activities, makes the teaching and learning of these skills clearly visible and accessible for both you and your students. But a word of warning, although global skills will not be totally new to you, you're probably already promoting these skills in your classes. I'm thinking of digital literary skills and never more so than now or in the past year. Or collaborative skills, working together 
resolving differences of opinion through project work to reach consensus and agreement for a final presentation. As with any kind of change or shift in the way we teach and the way our students learn, I think it's important to build our knowledge and practice gradually. So tip number three would be to start small and build on previous knowledge and experience in a gradual way, in a way that suits your style of teaching, your group of students and your teaching context. So maybe you choose one or two global skills, such as intercultural awareness and critical thinking, and focus on developing those if your curriculum allows that, and choose and select the activities from the lessons and units that specifically focus on these skills. How often do we say to our students, it takes time, practice makes perfect, although I would say better, practice makes better as I don't think that perfect exists. Or consider the much cited we learn by doing. Well, surely the same applies to us. This trying out and reflection, I would say, is essential to our professional development. Tip number four, make the teaching and learning of these global skills visible and explicit by sharing them with your students. Set clear but achievable teaching and learning objectives and learning outcomes and communicate them to your students. A teaching objective related to a variety of reading texts, for example, on most popular sports in different countries could be expose students to a number of texts to explore what the most popular sports are in a number of different countries compare them to the most popular sports in their own country and see what they have in common. And maybe also look at or look at what's different. In this kind of activity, you can see how the language skill of reading with sub skills of possible predicting, gist questions, skimming and scanning for more detailed comprehension and a possible grammar focus on present simple and key vocabulary to describe sports and the language of comparison sits very well with the intercultural awareness. The intercultural awareness skill of relating sports, popular sports in other countries to one's own country and vice versa and what they have in common or what's different. The learning outcome here might be understand how sport has the power to bring countries together, not apart, despite the competitive element. Related to tip number four is obviously the question of assessment, the assessment of these global skills. As we integrate the skills into our English language classes in a dual approach, we'll need to consider how to assess them. So my tip number five would be not only teach global skills, but assess them too, and also in a visible, transparent and explicit way. Again, start small, identify clear assessment criteria, which you probably have already in your course book, and explicitly communicate them to your students to make sure that they know what is expected of them. Students' expectations, I think, have a direct bearing on their engagement in tasks and their successful completion. I think if we know what we expect or what is expected of us, we tend to perform in a more positive way. So ongoing formative assessment, assessment for learning, having can-do statements if you're working with the CEFR, Common European Framework of Reference, um, not just for language skills, but also can do statements for these global skills is something that we can do. And is something that is there already, I think, in many course books. If we break down these skills into sub skills, so if we look at the global skill of emotional self-regulation and consider assessment and performance tasks, I think we need to break them down into sub skills as we do for the language skills, speaking, reading, writing, listening. So if we want to focus on self-regulation, 
which is clearly related to social and emotional learning, such as self-management, managing behaviors, emotions to achieve goals, self-awareness, recognizing one's emotions and values, as well as one's strengths and challenges, or social awareness, showing understanding and empathy for others. These are sub-skills that we can work on and develop performance or assessment tasks where you set a clear objective, language objective, but you also identify clear global skills related objectives. For example, in project work, we're not only assessing their ability to use language, their presentational skills, their nonverbal communication skills, we could also assess their relationship skills. And we could incorporate that criteria into the assessment of a project or presentation the students have to create in a group and present to the rest of the class and make this part of, assess of the assessment criteria that make it visible and share it with our students. Again, related to all of the above, but in particular, I think, to the teaching of the skills is tip number six, what might be referred to as lead by example. If we want our students to develop their global skills and sub-skills, we need to use them. We need to apply them ourselves and show ourselves to be doing that. For example, making explicit our knowledge and experience of intercultural awareness, our experience and knowledge of other cultures, for example, and, and, and bringing that to our classes, modeling our experience of a particular aspect of another culture, such as gastronomy. I'm thinking because I live in Spain and gastronomy is really, really, really a, a key talking point or eating habits by sharing that experience according to set, set certain categories, such as what you found similar, different, and also surprising. Um, or if, you, if our plan is to include a focus on self-regulation skills with the sub-skill of managing emotions, we should model through ourselves and how we manage our emotions, and not just through texts or other people talking about it, I think we should model ourselves. Or if we can apply our knowledge and use of digital technology to the classroom, we can be a little creative in the way we design and execute our classes. Something as simple as using different voices to tell a story in pre-primary or primary, turning everyday objects into, into instruments. I'm thinking of a person I collaborate with here in Spain, who does that, who is a creative expert and applies a lot of creativity activities in his classroom and uses um, everyday objects, but turns them into instruments, um, um, which um, really engage the students in the activities. Use of props and encouraging students to join in are just some ways for us to be a model or example for our students and this, of course, helps to reinforce relationships. Tip number seven would be to include a digital how to, fo fo how to focus. I don't want to step on Mark's toes as he'll be presenting 10 tips for advancing digital teaching skills a little bit later. But I do think that digital literacy as a global skill is a key and is a key one. And now more than ever. I would always say, um, try to include the digital competence through the choice of media, apps such as Padlet, Mentimeter, Answer Garden, Miro, Miro um, boards, uh, many more, uh, breakout rooms, Google Classroom, et cetera, et cetera, when developing global skills, rather than seeing digital literacy as something separate. Hey, Louise, oh, so, sorry to interrupt you in full flow there, but we've run over the time a little bit. So I'm going to put your, your, your 10 points on the screen okay. and I, I'm going to invite the audience to read them and uh, throw any questions uh, that they have at you. So give me one second. Sorry to interrupt you, but just no to problem. keep on no track. Problem. It's good. It's good to keep me on track. Great. So, 
here are Louis, uh, Louise's tips. If you've got any questions, put them in the box or the Q&A box now and, and uh, Alejandro and Louise will, yeah. will deal yes, with those. Yes, Louis. Uh, one of the teachers has asked about self-regulation. How can we teach or help students uh, develop self-regulation? That's a question. Okay, managing emotions. How can we help them to, to develop their managing the, the, their emotions. Well, obviously in project work, in collaborative tasks, this is, a, this is um, a key area. And I think by working on collaboration and getting students to work in groups and monitoring what they're doing and giving feedback on that, not necessarily on an individual base, but maybe at a group level, picking up on certain points and highlighting them, we can help to make um, students aware of that. Yeah, but I do think it's something that needs to be developed over time. It's a process and it needs to be, we need to come back to it again and again. Are there any other questions? No, not anymore. Thank you, Louis. Okay, great. Can I say something about the other tips or not? No, <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> go on, Louise, if you, if you want to add something else, Louise, yeah, go, go, go ahead. I'll just put them back up on screen, no problem. Yeah, I just wanted to mention two, well, um, we've got eight, including um, a values focus for digital. That's important. And I just want to su suggest um, a practical um, tip. We, we work on classroom contracts at the beginning of, of, of the school year. What about creating netiquette contracts with, with, with your classes? That's something I think practical that we could do. And it certainly is a nice way to develop um, values, ways of behaving online. Number nine, sharing your ideas. We learn, uh, we have a lot of ideas. Why not share them with others? In the, in the staff room, um, online, I work with somebody in Spain who uh, shares a lot of ideas on her Instagram um, account and also has YouTube videos that she shares with other teachers. And finally, learn from others. Learn from others. Uh, attend webinars like this. Um, learn from others in the staff room. Um, watch videos. And I think together, we can learn a lot more and we have a lot more resources to put into practice. So that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Louis. Thank okay, you. So um, okay. now over to Alejandra. Right. <laughs> over to you. I'm going to disappear. I mean, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Hello, everybody. Hello from Argentina. And this time we are going to talk about advancing inclusivity. And when we talk about inclusivity, inclusion, we think about problems. We think about students who don't perform as well as others, students who may be dyslexic or ADD, or maybe somewhere on the autistic spectrum. But it's not only that. And we don't need any diagnosis, in fact, it doesn't matter. We are all special in some way. We are all unique in some way. We all have interests and special needs of some kind. So um, there is an ethos of inclusion, and that is the philosophy that, uh, this is the first tip, recognizing and celebrating diversity. We take diversity as a problem. And when we struggle to cater for needs, we take that as, a, as an effort, as a great effort, and teachers complain. And in fact, we should celebrate the fact that we are all different. And um, the mistake is to think that all students are equal. No, they are not equal. They are all different. And it's good that they are all different, because then we should guarantee that everybody has the same opportunity to get to achieve success. And that is the difference between equity and equality. They are not the same. We should guarantee success or at least the opportunity to succeed. And the second piece of advice, the second tip 
has to do with promoting this ethos of, of uh, inclusivity. Why? Because um, this has to do with values. This has to do with beliefs. And uh, we don't have to wait for others. We very often complain, but complaining leads nowhere. We have to become leaders. We have to start doing something to help everybody, especially to help those children who take longer to copy, who get distracted more easily, who copy with a lot of mistakes, who find reading comprehension impossible, but also those who are anxious, those who have organization difficulties, also those who are bright and get bored, and uh, we shouldn't wait. We are the ones who, who should start um, opening the doors, the different doors. First, going beyond our classroom, involving everybody, sharing with everybody. Remember that this is not something that we can do on our own. If we want to walk towards inclusion, then we have to include everybody. And everybody means colleagues, family, all the community, and also the authorities. The third tip has to do with a change in our mindsets. That is focusing on strengths and interests, not just on negative things. We know what they cannot do. We know that they take longer. We know they, if I give them this test, maybe they fail. So the question is, what can I do to avoid this? What can I do to celebrate success, to give them the chance to celebrate success and to focus on their needs, their interests, on this celebration of success? We have to start changing the way we correct, the way we target questions, the way we give instructions through proximity, through eye contact, making sure that, first of all, a stronger student gives an example so that then I can call a weaker student in a way guaranteeing that that student will be able to give the right answer. Uh, because we struggle, but they suffer. And very often the family also suffers. And here comes the next step, which has to do with barriers. We have to identify the barriers. Why is it that that child doesn't learn? Why is it that he misbehaves? Why is it that they cannot focus on anything? And we uh, very often say, well, he just cannot. Well, he is weird. Well, well is not an answer. The answer is, why? He cannot focus. Okay, all the time. Have you noticed at least once when he was able to focus and why did he focus? What changed there? If we can go beyond that complaint and start observing to get information, that is the key. Identifying barriers, because if we don't identify what is stopping that child, what is deterring that child from learning, then we will never find a solution. And as educators, we must provide a solution because every child should have the right to learn. And this takes me to the next uh, step, the next, yes, yeah, celebrate victories. I completely agree. Uh, tip number five has to do with starting small. Also, as Lewis said, we think about inclusion as a very big problem. Well, actually, there are very small things that we can do, and they guarantee a change. They guarantee results. For example, using what I call a reading window. This is something I have made myself, you know, color. This is important. This is green. You know, the color works on the brain in different ways. Some children work better, read better, understand better when this reading window is blue. Others when it's black. It depends on each child. It's trial and error. The reading window works like this. It helps the student focus. A transparent ruler works in the same way. A very simple thing that we can do when we give them activities, we can use color paper and you stick the activity like this so that the color becomes a frame and the frame affects the brain in that it helps the child to focus bigger fonts, sometimes to get uh, cheaper photocopies, 
our activities look really small and they are gray and not black. Okay, bigger font, a bigger font that is essential. The, um, the face, face validity that is essential here, clarity. Okay, and also these children, <laughs> thank you, these children um, learn better when we use a multisensory approach multi-sensory normally in any classroom we speak we show some pictures they listen but it's much more than that it's hands-on it's doing it's trying trying with different materials it's ticking it's cutting projects are excellent for this but also at a different level maybe in the secondary school uh, when you are teaching students to write instead of a picture or instead of just a title why not using sound effects sounds they have to activate the schema they try to associate the sound with what happened and from there there is a lot of creativity there they produce a writing piece also from a picture okay but describe what is happening but then invent a story imagine what is happening what is happening imagine what happened before and what is going to happen in the next five or ten minutes and then tell the story from somebody else's point of view using feelings emotions all this is going to change the perspective now um the key to all this and this is my seventh tip has to do with making a difference through noticing and recording noticing and recording it's much more than just noticing that there is a child who cannot learn i don't mean noticing in that way i mean investigating observing because these children who have special needs um tell us what affects them, what they like doing, what they cannot stand, where they work better, who they prefer to sit next to, because they all have a good body and that we have to take advantage of. So um, that is noticing. But then I said, uh, making a difference through noticing and recording. And we do record, we write down marks, we keep a record of that. Even platforms offer, offer us the chance to track students' progress. But I mean something different. I mean the classroom narrative, not just marks, not just eight or nine or four or A, B or C. What is happening to that child? Did he smile? Why did he smile? Did, did he participate a little bit better today? If so, why? Was he sad? Did he tell me he was sad? Why? All this is what matters. And all this is what has to be recorded and is not recorded so often. Of course, it's difficult when we've got 30 students in the classroom. Of course, it's difficult when you have English maybe twice a week or three times a week. Well, uh, walking into inclusivity is not easy. And the first thing is willingness. This is why I always ask my teachers, um, are you really willing to change things? Because that's the first question we have to ask ourselves. And if we are willing to do it, then there are tips, there are things we can do. Of course, there is no recipe. Nobody can tell us this is right, this is wrong. Something works in one context and it doesn't work in another. And then we have three more pieces of advice. The next one has to do with flipping our classrooms, which um, is about technology, yes, but it, it, is, it also goes hand in hand with uh, what we call in, in uh, when we deal with inclusivity, what we call anticipation. We have to anticipate, we have to give children more time to read things at home, to watch a video at home, to do the listening, to listen for gist at home, so that when that child comes to the classroom and I do the activity, at least they feel more confident and confidence is essential. We also have to empower these children to empower positive changes and that we do it through choice and voice and these children don't usually have a voice because they are shy because they find it hard to express themselves so um, this goes hand in hand with relationships fostering relationships working with the human being 
not just with the student with learning grammar and vocabulary and relationships okay. means the student and me and the student with the other students. Thank you, Lemmy. Okay. Thank, okay. thank you, Alejandra. Yeah, I, I, I got a couple of questions from teachers. Go ahead. Okay. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Okay. The first one says, what's the importance of self-regulation in language teaching? The importance of self-regulation has to uh -huh. do with emotional learning. Okay. Uh, this, um, this goes together with inclusivity because social and emotional learning um, is very important, as I was telling you, because of relationships and basically because all these children are rejected. But unfortunately, uh, because the situation is difficult and because we lack training, because we have to be honest, nobody teaches us how to teach reading comprehension when our students are dyslexic. How can we deal with an autistic child? Or at least what mustn't we do? Because it's a question of not hurting the student's feelings. So self-regulation is essential, but they find it very hard on their own. It's hard work, it's, reg it's a regular thing, and it has to do, first of all, with that good body, okay? There is always a couple, there is always a pair, and that pair has to be together most of the time, because that includes the two families. That good body is the one that Peter, when he gets home and he cannot understand anything because he hasn't finished, he hasn't copied anything, or he doesn't understand his handwriting, that is, Peter is the one he's going to, to call. He is the one who's going to ask for help. So relationships, fostering all this is essential. Great, great answer. Uh, um, you know, you've answered two questions there, so thank you very much. <laughs> well, <laughs> Alejandra, yeah, and I love the idea of identifying barriers. I think it's essential. Definitely, definitely. Um, I think we, we must not stop uh, because many teachers feel discouraged and they stop mm -hmm. saying, well, he cannot read this. Well, he cannot do that. There are strategies segmentation uh, these children in general all these they're not pathologies they are conditions that's what we call them okay all these conditions these children cannot do more than four four questions four sentences four so if you have an exercise that has got 10 segment it when you give them a test segment it okay if you have a long the, the page has got a long reading comprehension text and then it's got five or six questions one paragraph and the questions that correspond to that paragraph. Then the second paragraph and the, question that co the questions that correspond to that paragraph. That is called reorganization. And the, the, another strategy has to do with transformation. Uh, very often they take ages to copy. Very often they make a lot of mistakes when they write a lot. It's much better for them to just tick or draw a cross. It's much better to match. It's much better to circle the correct answer. So transform productive activities into choice, for example, and that's going to help them a lot, at least to feel confident and that gradually or orally we can do uh, the productive thing. Definitely, great idea. Um, thank you very much, Alejandra. Mark, do we still have time for another question? No, I think it, I think we could start with you now, if you like, Lemmy. What do you think? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Alejandra. Thank you very much. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Lemmy Trujillo. I'm in Mexico. Uh, so I'm going to tell you some tips on assessment for the future, okay? So here, here, here they go. The first one, uh, let students know what the objectives are, okay? When students know what we expect from them, motivation increases and therefore achievement. Uh, as we have uh, heard before with, with Luis and Alejandra, it's essential that students understand what is required of them before attempting a task, okay? Uh, what is the objective? What do we want them to, to achieve? What is the success criteria, for example? No? Those criteria should be given in the language that students can actually understand. So be careful with, with basic learners, okay? 
uh, what's more, we could also discuss and even negotiate with the class to increase a, a sense of say and ownership and maximize engagement. No, so so we can uh, negotiate uh, the rules for example. Okay. Uh, tip number two: use examples and models. When students have a model of what they are to do, the task become easier since they have a guide to follow. This is absolutely crucial with productive tasks. For example, now uh, with writing, we can direct students to sample answers and give them step-by-step -step guides. With speaking, it's great if you provide them with a mood, mood model. We, we can uh, role-play a conversation, for example, with one of the students so they know what they should do or, or what a, a letter uh, looks like, for example. No? And it's one great use of teacher talking time when we model the activity. Okay, uh, tip number three, give descriptive feedback regularly. Uh, there is a wide agreement these days that good quality supportive feedback is one of the most important things that a student gets from the teacher. So just tell them what they have done wrong Okay, take time to highlight the things that you like. Praise the students for the work, as, as uh, my colleagues have mentioned before. This builds your relationship with the students. And most importantly, uh, encourage them to produce a second attempt using the information on the first one. Okay. Uh, and then here we will move from feedback to feed forward. So instead of rating and judging students' performance uh, in the past, we focus on the development in the future. Okay. Uh, so now tip number four, explain, discuss, and negotiate learning goals. Okay. As teachers, we know what we need to achieve. We know the curriculum requirements, uh, but it won't do as much good uh, as it could if students don't understand why we do the things we do. So uh, let's talk about our goals with the students and perhaps uh, work out common ones with them, okay? So we can negotiate uh, a class contract at the beginning of the school year, for example, no? Apart from this, each and every student should have their own personal goals. To do this, they need to be able to identify both their strengths and what they need to work on, okay? Uh, but self-assessment is not a skill that we are born with. Okay, we, we should teach them how to assess themselves. So for example, um, at the end of each work, uh, at the end of each unit, for example, or at the end of, of uh, a lesson, we can tell our students to choose one piece of work that they are particularly proud of and send it to you or show it to you. Okay, and then probably tell you why they are proud of that specific task they've done. Okay. Uh, tip number five, select the task you assess students on very carefully, okay? Uh, we should assess students what we have touched. So the type of task we choose and the proportions of this matters a great deal. Uh, so use tasks to help students learn and demonstrate their understanding of a specific language point or skill area. Uh, avoid monotonous superficial tasks where students' activities restricted and led to pure chance and guessing. No, this doesn't necessarily mean that they uh, should produce extended answers, but we can give them different types of activities like transformations or, or different types of activities. Okay, not always the same uh, task. Uh, tip number six, keep track of and share their learning. Uh, lifelong learning increases when students reflect on what they have learned and share their knowledge and their achievements with you and, and their, another student. Uh, but how can we do this? Well, the idea of portfolios, for example, comes in the handy. Uh, the idea is just uh, that students can store selected assignments, written assignments, whatever they, they would like to include in that portfolio, or we can use any portfolio that uh, now we've, we're, we've been using a lot, okay? But what is the point of using portfolios? Uh, the, to use these portfolios during re reflective 
reflective session, sorry, uh, when students go over their past thesis and reflect on their progress they, ha they have made. They could even attempt to improve on an in earlier task and correct their own errors, which they are now able to see and correct their, their errors, right? Okay, tip number seven, ask students to reflect on the lesson they have just experienced. So take the last five minutes to resolve the class, tell students what they have learned and how they would use their knowledge in a real situation. Uh, the use of XCG kits makes it more dynamic and enjoyable, okay? So uh, you can start by asking students to write one thing they have learned today, for example, a new word, uh, a new structure, anything they want. And then gradually get them to be more open and possibly critical, okay? You can use Jan board, for example, and use the, the different colors of the post-it notes to tell you what they have learned, okay? For, for example, green, if they have learned that very well, or, or yellow, if they are still easy about that uh, specific point, or probably uh, red or any other color, if they still don't understand it. Or uh, you can use the same post-it note uh, and ask them to paste them on the board, for example, ones that we go uh, face to face, or we can use the traffic lights activity, for example, okay? But it's very important to ask students to reflect on the lesson, okay? That was tip number seven. Uh, tip number eight, maximize your, your repertoire of assessment techniques, okay? There are many other ways other than traditional tips to find out what and how much your students have learned, okay? For example, we can ask students to write a test for another student or a pair of students, or ask them to complete graphic organizers, for example, or uh, talking about uh, summative assessments, for example, we can uh, give them open book tests, or even uh, asking them or having them take tests together, you now in pairs or even ask them to write a test for you, why not? <laughs> okay, uh, then here comes my tip number nine. Okay, get students to self-assess and peer assess. Assessment can be done not only by the teacher, but also by other students and the students themselves, okay? Uh, these alternative ways are more effective. Many colleagues who uh, worry about reliability of such forms of assessment, but note that if this is not uh, this is not really an issue if we are talking about ongoing assessment, okay? Uh, and there are also clear non-linguistic benefits of such forms of assessment. Uh, Self-assessment and peer assessment promote a whole range of interpersonal and soft skills. Now we we uh, students will be more independent, more autonomous. And we also help them develop self-regulation, okay? What, what Alejandro was talking about a while ago, okay? And uh, my last tip on, on assessment, okay? Build your students' self-esteem and motivational beliefs, okay? Uh, students need to know what they are doing is worthwhile. Therefore, make sure assessment and feedback activate students' motivation to learn successfully. Okay, design activities that gradually get more difficult. Give the students the opportunity to rewrite some of their work. Uh, a lot of resubmissions, for example. Give the students uh, marks only after you have given feedback. Okay, give students think time and wait time to answer, for example. Okay, remember that motivation is a key factor for explaining the, the success or failure of any activity. And students with a good attitude are more likely to work hard and keep going when learning gets challenging. Okay, um, it is similar to or what we have uh, heard from Luis and, and Alejandra uh, a few minutes ago. So thank you, Mark. There you you see my team. Excellent, Lenny. That, wow, that was really quick. You, you did it perfectly. Like, I'm not complaining about anybody at all, but that was that was awesome. We were worried about squeezing all that information to 10 minutes and you did it. So guys, let, let me uh, slides are on the screen. Take a look. And if you've got any questions, uh, drop those in the, the chat box or the question box. 
there is a good question in there already, let me. I, okay. I wonder if we can come up with a good answer. Uh, okay. And it, it relates to the idea of um, students developing uh, or students developing clever strategies to be able to deal with exams. So Fakhradin asks that, he says, uh, students mostly for summative assessment have learned how to manage the tests cleverly. They know the tricks uh, to be able to answer the questions. How can we manage assessment? So I guess what he's asking is, um, if our students are clever with exams and they know how to find the right answers, uh, how can we get around that problem? Well, I think, um, first of all, uh, as I said before, it's important to, uh, uh, well, I, I'm not sure if I understood the question correctly. I understood that she wants to know how we can help students uh, answer tests Correctly. No, I, I think, I, sorry, that's probably my fault for, for uh, kind of making a mess of the question. I think it's okay. like sometimes students uh, have developed fantastically effective strategies and techniques for answering exams, even okay. if they don't necessarily know all of the answers, but they have strategies uh -huh. that help them. So how can we get around that problem? Oh, okay, I get it. Uh, I think, in fact, <laughs> I, uh, that one is related to tip number eight, I guess, no? Yes. Uh, if, if probably they answer that exam because they are used to answering that type of question, no? So the idea would be to change and give them different tasks. So if you always uh, give them multiple choice questions, then include multiple choice and then ask them to find the mistake and correct the mistake and then probably uh, complete a conversation or something like that. So I would include different a variety of activities so they don't get used to answering the same all the time, it, could, no? it could be exams, it could be performance assessment, it could be portfolios, it could be self-assessment, right? Mixing exactly. it up. Right? Okay, exactly. there's one more question, Lemi, that I want to ask you because I think you're the perfect person to answer this question. Uh -huh. uh, Beatriz Jimenez Lopez asks, Lemi, which age is best for students to make portfolios and have self-assessment on the work they have done? Okay, uh, I love that question. Um, and I'm sure Mark knows why. I of the idea that everybody, every student can uh, learn how to assess themselves, even though they are four, five, six, 10, 20, it doesn't matter the age. So the only thing is to teach them how to do it. Exactly, we could do it with, with young learners as well. So show them how, okay? So you give them, um, I don't know, you're, you're practicing um, vocabulary uh, and they had to, uh, um, type the letter or whatever, the word. So, so show them uh, or, or show them yeah, the collection of work they've done and, and teach them how they, can, uh, how they can choose or why they uh, ask them, for example, choose the best or the, the task that you like the most or the activity, uh, your, the best work that you think you've done today. And then uh, ask them why. So I don't think the age has to do with, with self-assessment. No, it, it's just the, uh, the important things that would teach them how to do it, as, as I said before, right? Absolutely. Perfect, Lemmy. Okay, I think it's my Thank turn you. now. Thanks Thank very you, much, Lemmy. Thanks for your questions, guys. Thank you. Okay, guys, so it's now my 10 minutes. I'm going to start my, my stopwatch now and... I am talking about advancing digital teaching skills. And tip number one is plan a mix of plenary and small group work in online classes. Now, it might feel most comfortable when we're in Zoom to work in plenary. Um, and it might feel like a real effort to organize breakout rooms or get the students to work in, in pairs or small groups. But research uh, that I referenced in my session on digital teaching skills earlier in the year from the Open University uh, in the UK uh, shows that students are more motivated, more engaged, more interested in the lessons when online teachers use uh, breakout rooms for small group work, uh, for pair work, as well as uh, whole group activities. So. If you have access to breakout rooms, uh, take advantage of them. If you don't, and I know many teachers don't, then perhaps have asynchronous work where students work in pairs uh, and in small groups uh, outside of the main class. And consider using things like uh, private chat for pair work for role plays and, and conversation activities. Tip number two 
is set up students for success. Now, students will be more motivated to do work that we set for them to do independently when they feel a sense of self-efficacy. And self-efficacy is basically uh, one's belief in their own ability to succeed in a task. So if we feel like we can succeed, we're more likely to engage in the activity. This means that uh, teachers need to get the level of challenge right for the students. Uh, it means that maybe we need to model strategies that we want the students to use. If so, if we want them to scan a text or skim a text, for example, we're going to need to spend time showing them how to do that. Uh, we're going to have to show them explicitly how to use uh, tools uh, that we want them to use. So if we're asking them to use an app to practice vocabulary, we're going to have to uh, demonstrate that. OK, so set up students for success was tip number two. Tip number three is. Don't forget the social presence. Now, in the best face to face classes, there uh, is open communication, there's a sense of trust, there's a group identity, uh, students feel comfortable to project their personalities, to take risks, uh, to, to, to say what they feel like saying. Uh, and it's important in an online class too. Um, earlier in the year, in a previous session, I was arguing that maybe when we started working online, we were most concerned with uh, the tools that we were going to use in class. But it's important that we uh, try to develop a social presence. Uh, so maybe we make sure there's time in the class for some kind of social chit chat at the beginning or the end of the lesson. Maybe at this, with, the, with a new group at the start of a course, we post introductions about ourselves in video format or in text format, and we invite each other to read or listen and comment on those and we celebrate success. So if we all pass the progress test, let's celebrate it. Let's have a fun lesson. Let's watch a video or let's have a virtual party or something like that and try to create that social presence. Tip number four is trust in your teaching skills. Um, so research from the Open University in the UK shows us that when online language learners were asked to rank what they thought what they thought were the most important characteristics of online language teachers the number one most highly ranked item was uh, teaching skills and number two was language awareness so our students are looking for teachers that um, are able to create the conditions for learning, that are able to help students learn things like grammar, pronunciation, vocabulary, uh, and you know, that are able to create a, a kind of positive classroom environment. Uh, out of the six uh, items that were ranked on the list by the Open University, tech skills actually ranked number five, so second from bottom. Students are interested in your teaching skills, your language skills uh, uh, primarily, okay? Uh, OK, uh, tip number five is enhance your flipped classroom with retrieval practice and active learning. And whether you're teaching online or whether you're teaching blended or face to face, there are lots of uh, favorable arguments for promoting flip learning. Flip learning is where we ask the students typically to do some receptive work or some study work outside of the class in preparation for the live class where we focus on communication, production and feedback. However, for this to work well, their research shows that there needs to be a good overlap between what the students do outside of class and what they do inside of class. And two principles that we can apply here to make sure that it works. Uh, one is retrieval practice, which means bring information that you know to mind. So if the students have studied some vocabulary uh, outside of class, uh, when we get to class next day or whatever, uh, give them a quick quiz on that vocabulary so that they have to access it from their memory. Or if they've done some reading outside of class, put them in pairs to discuss the key points from the reading and then follow up those retrieval practice activities with active learning activities. So the typical kinds of things that we're doing. Okay. Yeah. If we could okay. just wait for a while. Yes, yes. he will exactly. come back. <laughs> he will come back. Yeah. And actually, I, I could share my screen with the tips okay. if you think that's yeah a good idea. Okay. So um, yeah, we can all discuss a few things if you want. Yeah. 
<coughs> okay, so I'm just going down. Let me find it. Can you see that? Yes. 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 Okay, so we're, uh -huh. here we are. Yeah, yeah, digital teaching. Okay. Here's Mark. Okay, Mark. Okay. <laughs> You're back. Mark. Doing, showing your tips. Sorry, guys. Yeah, it's hurricane season here. I knew this was going to happen. Uh, you can hear me okay. All right. Thanks for showing the yeah. tips, guys. Um, yeah. So I think I was on the one about practicing transitions, right? So the idea there is uh, <coughs> rehearse your technology. Uh, do you want me to go back to sharing my screen? Yes, I'm going to stop sharing okay. my screen now. Just one second. Okay. Perfect. Thanks very much, Luis. Uh, brilliant, brilliant. So there I was talking about the importance of smooth transitions and, and uh, mastering the technology. And uh, my technology failed me. Uh, so yeah, practice this kind of stuff. Um, personally, I'll give you a really uh, good personal example. Since we've been doing these kinds of sessions online, and I've been doing teacher training sessions online uh, with my teachers, I'll put the slides back up in a second, sorry. Um, I've been using Google for everything. So I use Google presentations uh, and I use Chrome as my browser. And so, for example, if I'm gonna have a word wall or a Padlet or a Jamboard or whatever it is, I'll have my Google presentation in a favorites folder on my navigation bar alongside uh, my word wall or my interactive activity or whatever it is. So I can just jump from one to the next one without having to look for it on my computer. OK, um, tip number seven was utilize a platform to help you manage the whole uh, process. So tools like Edmodo or Google Classroom or Macmillan's tools like the Macmillan English Teacher app or Navio can help us uh, monitor student learning. Uh, an LMS or a platform is useful for things like making audio and video files and worksheets available for students uh, and also to help us kind of create, to send, to mark and to return homework. Uh, so that was tip number seven. Uh, tip number eight is collect data as you go for formative assessment. So tools like Kahoot, breakout rooms, uh, Google Forms for self-assessment can-do statements are great for uh, enabling us to feed into our teaching and learning and improving learning. Uh, so any results from Kahoot can, can help improve the learning in our classroom. So there's lots of opportunities with online tools for formative assessment. Uh, and as Ricardo uh, Chiappini said in his blog post, make it valuable by keeping stuff online for students. So if they've completed a can-do statement, put it online uh, so the students can refer to it. Alejandra, have I got time to finish the last two or shall I just show them? Yes, it's one more minute. Okay, so you may go on. Yeah. Okay, so integrate well-being and mindfulness in your digital teaching practice. So Emma Reynolds gave us this fantastic session on mindfulness techniques for language teachers. Being in front of a screen all day can be hard work. And when we're online, there are a lot of distractions. So mindfulness techniques can uh, help us regain focus. Many of the techniques suggested by Emma Reynolds focused on breathing and becoming very conscious of our breaths. And so one that I really loved was this idea of uh, counting your in-breath, counting how many seconds your in-breath is, and then extending your, your out-breath by two more seconds. So if you breathe in for three seconds, and then breathe out for five seconds, like that. I'm not, I'm not a mindfulness coach, right? But that's the idea. Uh, she had a fantastic technique um, where the idea was that you are sat uh, at a train station, the technique is called thought trains. Uh, and you imagine yourself sat at a train station and you try to focus on your breathing. And as negative or distracting thoughts come into your mind, try to imagine them as trains leaving the platform and disappearing. Right. So that was another technique of hers. And tip number 10 is keep developing through your CPD, your continuous professional development. Others have mentioned that it doesn't matter if you're a newbie or an expert. There's always something new to learn. So as uh, Louis said, attend sessions like this, check out blog posts online, uh, develop a, a, an online uh, professional learning network on Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn. And if you're an expert, connect and share because others will definitely want to learn from you. So my apologies for the technological issues. Here are my tips uh, once again, and uh, you'll be getting them in your inbox as well. Yeah. 
Yes, okay. I don't know if you have any other questions. Uh, you have answered some, Mark, because one of the teachers asked about apps and you have already mentioned a few. Uh, we've got an interesting question about feedback, giving feedback, and we will cover that in the next talk with specific advice. And there's another interesting question that I think we can all share, that is, how can we organize teamwork in this new normal, which is hybrid, face-to-face, -face, online? Well, I, I don't see, I wonder if they're talking about teachers teamwork or student teamwork, but, but either way, yeah. I mean, there, there's no boundaries. I mean, it's easier. Look at us. We're in we're in Monterrey, Querétaro, Buenos Aires, and uh, where's Luis in, in Madrid or Barcelona? And uh, you know, it works. Uh, this is the new normal. I, I mean, using Zoom, using Google Meet, having your students connect outside of class in their own sessions. I mean, there are lots of ways uh, to do it. I think it's just a question of modeling it, demonstrating it, making sure that students know exactly what's expected, and then and then trying it. Yeah, and I think starting small applies all the same because I mean, start practicing, we should start learning first, practicing at home and then trying perhaps with a small group once, uh, trial and error, trial and error, definitely, yeah. Perfect. And um, sorry, one of the teachers um, is interested in self-regulation in the flipped classroom. If you can recommend, uh, something an author or I, know, I, yeah, yeah um, in terms of I mean I, I wouldn't want to restrict it to just the flip classroom right? obviously there's a connection there no? because we're asking students to take responsibility for their learning my favorite book uh, related to formative assessment is Dylan Williams book uh, embedded formative assessment and it has a short section uh, on self-regulation but if you were to look for any psychology text uh, or an educational uh, psychology that's been written in the last 20 years, you're going to find information on self-regulation because uh, there is a strong correlation between self-regulation and educational uh, attainment. And I think even the famous, famous research by John Hattie, where he tried to find you know, evidence-based approaches to education that work, uh, focused on uh, to some degree, self-regulation. So Hattie, Dylan, William, or just a general Google search on um, psychology and education. Oh, of course, uh, Mac, the Paul Grave Macmillan Handbook of Motivation has a section on self-regulation as well, right? It's an excellent, it's 600 pages long, but it's it's really, really good, right? <laughs> yeah, and one last question. Do you think quizzes are a good way to assess students? Well, it depends on the purpose. I think that quizzes are a good way uh, to uh, provide retrieval practice. And if we are tri triangulating our assessment procedures so that we take multiple measures of a student performance uh, for summative purposes, then quizzes can certainly come into that as well. But you wouldn't want it to be the only tool for assessment. And that's it. <laughs> Perfect. All right. So I'll <laughs> hand over to you, Alejandra. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mark. I'm going to stop okay. sharing. All right. Okay. So um, now we go on with teaching skills. Okay. And it's funny because normally when we say, when we think of skills, we associate the word with linguistic skills, listening, speaking, writing, reading, but this time it's teaching skills. Um, skills can be learned. Skills can be developed skills can be brushed up. So this means that we as teachers can and should brush up our skills, our teaching skills. Um, the question is that in order to brush up our teaching skills, first we have to assess our own work. And for that, we have to be willing to assess our own work. We have to be um, interested in learning, motivating, motivated so as to get better and better. The good teacher is the one who gets better every day. The good teacher is the one who realizes and changes things. And so here go my tips. The first one has to do with motivation. We have to work to get motivation, extrinsic motivation. Students don't come to our lessons saying, hey, it's English today. In the same way, we probably didn't go to school with that motivation. It's up to us. We have to work for that. We have to plan for that. And also we have to make them aware, plan and pay attention to their well-being. But I cannot motivate if I am not motivated. 
I cannot think or teach others to think about well-being if I don't pay attention to my well-being. So this has to do with socio-emotional learning. And this is very important because uh, paying attention to this, paying attention to emotions, paying attention to feelings, paying attention to others um, gets better behavior, better attitudes in the classroom. And how can we get this? very easily, but it's every day, every day, it's a routine. It's not a page in a book. It's not once in a plan, it's a routine. Um, you can work on it through songs, through stories, um, the vocabulary, vocabulary about emotions. How are you happy and sad? It's much more than that. Allowing students to express their feelings and giving them the language they need to express their feelings. Uh, this goes hand in hand with my second tip. We, we cannot do anything if first we don't aim at this, getting better, improving, developing as professionals. And uh, this has to do with upskilling. How can we do it? These seminars, Macmillan is always there for you, but then reading teachers books. The teachers books that we are producing at Macmillan, I think they are masterpieces. They teach a lot. They have fantastic tips. Uh, there are extra activities that you can use, even if you're not using that book in particular. So it's learning from others, it's sharing, it's collaboration. We all learn from everybody else, but I can only learn if first I decide and I realize, I become aware of the fact that there is something I can brush up. If I think I know it all, I will not learn anything probably, but I will not transmit anything either. The third tip has to do with paying attention to the sea wheel. Carol Reed speaks about this and it's very interesting. When we talk about methodology, when we talk about the classroom, teaching, the first C is the child, the child at the center. Whatever we do has to focus on the child, but then there are other Cs. If I give you a minute, I know you can write a long list of C's, creativity, collaboration, what else? Celebration of success, curiosity, care, but always thinking about the child. Now, all those C's we have mentioned, creativity, care, they are not um, directly related to language. It's not vocabulary, it's not grammar, it's not reading, and it is at the same time. These C's pay attention to other areas because we are focusing on the child as a whole, and the child as a whole implies not just linguistic development, it's not a question of teaching the child just language because we are educators, teachers of English, but first teachers. As such, we have to pay attention to all the other um, areas of development, psychological development, cognitive development, emotional development, social development. All this is essential. But for all this, I have to read, I have to investigate, I have to realize that there is something I can learn. And that is only up to us, up to each of us. Uh, the next tip has to do with, the, with our mindset, like changing the, changing the way we think. Uh, we called it the growth mindset. And this comes from a TED talk that we love, that in general, we share this, um, this information. A TED talk by Carol Dweck. She talks, you know about what? She talks about the not yet answer. And here I go back to the question about giving feedback that somebody asked Mark. How do we give feedback after speaking or after any kind of activity? And this not yet is fantastic. Because if I give it, of course my students are going to make mistakes of different kinds. They're going to make more or fewer mistakes. Now, what do I do? I give them an eight, four, three below standard, A, B, or C. What if I write not yet? I am changing the whole thing. Not yet means it's not yet, it's not ready now, but it will be, it may be. While if I write below standard or C or D or two, that means this is it. 
and it will be is. And I'm like closing a door. So the not yet answer, if we start using it, we will uh, be focusing or aiming at or fostering, fostering resilience, fostering the process, paying attention to process rather than just result. We will be praising effort, not intelligence. We will be uh, celebrating how they do it, if they do it gradually, but they are improving a little thing and not just who does it the fastest of all. Um, the next step and very closely related to this has to do with engagement. Engagement and personalization because personalization leads to engagement. Um, personalization has to do with giving everybody a, a voice. Personalization has to do with whatever you are reading saying, well, what happens in your city? What happens in your country? When you talk about clothes, what about you? When you talk about houses, what about your house? When you talk about a school, what about your school? In that way, you are narrowing down everything to a more concrete level. And if they do that, then you are likely to get more engagement. Engagement, motivation, they don't grow on trees. We have to work towards them and we have to plan for that and pay attention so that we get really that. Um, I think that the best piece of advice is to use our cell phones and to go personal, as I call it. Um, we teach routines. What if I show them a picture of myself cooking in my kitchen, perhaps wearing pajamas. They will have a good laugh. They will love it. And that will have a much better effect than Mary gets up at seven o'clock in the morning and they don't know who Mary is and they don't care who Mary is. A photo, my photo, my family, my pet, and then they can share theirs. Um, most books start with an opener, fantastic photos, pictures to describe, um, phrases to discuss. Most of these photos, we can find a video for that. And videos, the same as photos, have a much better impact, a much better effect on the brain that will engage the student. And a student who is engaged, a student who is curious is going to be motivated. If a student says, Oh, the moment they say, I look, oh, look, I think it's, that means I can start teaching because I have hooked them on. But at the same time, I am there paying attention all the time, working hard to get their engagement, their motivation. But at the same time, parallel to this, I have to develop their autonomy. Autonomous learning is essential. And uh, it's hard. It's hard to to pay attention to so many things. But for autonomous learning, it's, um, it's very important to work on routines, to uh, draw their attention, for example, to the icons in the textbook, to the instructions, because if you thumb through your books, the instructions, the verbs in the instructions are repeated. So if we draw their attention to that, they are likely to or they will probably anticipate what comes. They will understand what they have to do. Some books at the bottom say workbook page five. Well, if we teach them that if they finish, instead of saying miss, miss, miss a hundred times, they can go directly to the workbook. That is also autonomous learning. And um, autonomous learning goes hand in hand with self-assessment. Okay, so again, I go back to self-assessment. I have to teach all my children, all ages, to self-assess their work. But as a teacher, I have to self-assess self my work. How can I self-assess? Well, I can record my lessons. I can invite a peer, a colleague, to my classroom. Of course, there are coordinators, headmasters, headmistresses who may come Again, supervisors, if you want. But recording is a good start. And you will notice, for example, something that is typical and that we don't pay so much attention. In our effort to help children, we tend to make a lot of yes, no questions instead of WH questions. And WH questions lead to more critical thinking, lead, lead to more productive answers. But in an effort to help, 
you will notice probably uh, in general, this is what happens that we make many more yes, no questions than WH questions. And uh, of course we have to develop critical literacy and visual literacy. We talk about reading comprehension. We have to teach them to get meaning from everything on the page. And everything is the text, but everything includes photographs, captions, headlines. Very often when we make a question, they say, I doesn't say, why don't you look properly? Okay, and making interesting questions. Um, somebody was asking before as regards assessment, what if they get used to the whole thing and they discover the trick to get over it? Well, uh, sometimes we also have to elaborate everything in such a way that um, we challenge them. If we don't challenge them, they get bored. If they get bored, they don't learn. So challenging has to do with, for example, very simple, she is 13. Let us not ask how old is she? We can ask, is she a teenager? Most of the students will say, it doesn't say. So those very simple things or true and false, why not true, false, not mentioned? That develops uh, critical thinking in a better way, in a, on a more regular basis, I would say. I've got three more. <laughs> uh, Louis, I don't know if you want to share the tips and then can go uh, through them because if not, we will take ages. The next tip has to do with uh, paying attention and working towards and developing, I am in number eight, life skills and global citizenship. Uh, because that child, and we mentioned the child as a whole, well, the child as a whole, yes, belongs in the family, belongs in the school, but belongs in the world. So um, it's good that they should learn when they read about a school, okay, a school here, but what about a school somewhere else? A school that is completely different, learning about other children. This, you've got plenty of material in all our books. We pay a lot of attention to this. And life skills, because we are teachers of English. English is a language, but those students will walk away from the classroom. They will, go out into the world and as educators we should we should help them to develop the skills they will need to face that so then as a teaching skill normally apart from planning presenting assessing now we need to learn how to teach life skills and we need to learn how to teach global citizenship Okay, and we must make a point of using cross curricular material because that is that makes the language more natural that makes that teaches a lot of vocabulary new structures that teaches global comprehension and it shows that the child is a whole the child is one but maybe he's got physics maybe he's got language maybe he's got English but the child is one and we teachers can and should work together. And of course, all this when the child is sitting at school for so many hours and these children are special because their attention span is short, because they need to fidget all the time. It's hard for them to remain seated and usually classrooms are not ideal for that. Well, then variety is the key. And what do we mean by variety? Variety means variety in the activities, variety if it's written and then oral. So it's not, there's no such a thing as one day for listening. That never happens in real life. It's all skills integrated. Variety in the organization, it's individual work, it's pair work, it's group work. Variety in the pace. We cannot possibly be talking like this all the time. And we cannot go crazy all the time either. It's variety and variety is the key to it all. Thank you, Louis. <laughs> okay, I don't know if they have uh, any questions. I can't hear, you're muted, sorry. Yes, no, thank you very much, sorry. Um, that was great. You covered an awful lot. 
there in in a very short space of time and there is a question actually and yeah and and maybe it has to do as well with the fact that we're presenting and we're presenting a lot of ideas in a short space of time but um there is a comment in 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 the question and answer that some of the tips that that, that they're quite demanding uh, particularly for new teachers novice teachers um, there's a lot here to take on board. And maybe, you know, as I think we've all been saying more or less that um, um, we need to take small steps. We need to start small and build. Um, yeah. It's not about, you know, trying to, 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 to uh, build a castle in, in one day. Oh, not exactly, day. right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so I don't know what you think, but maybe, mm, Definitely. Um, Reiterating all, that here again. Yeah, that's a very good question. That's a very interesting question. I always, when I train teachers, I always make a question and I give them the chance to say, to give me the answer or just to keep it to themselves. And the question is, of all the things that are involved in the teaching process as such, which is complicated, long, complex, uh, what are you good at? And what do you feel you are not so good at? And I feel uh, that most of us know more or less. We've got a feeling. I'm not very good at this. I, uh, I'm going to make a confession. I work with my husband. We are both teachers. And whenever it comes to writing, he says, well, you teach writing. He loves the teaching of grammar. OK, so he focuses on that because we know we are not, not everybody's bright at everything. Now, if we know what we need to brush up, if we say, well, I don't like it very much, why don't we like it? Then we can start working on it. And anyway, there are no recipes. What works for one no. maybe doesn't work for another one because teaching is not a one person thing. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely, absolutely. And um, we need different input and we need it over time. And I think somebody put in the chat that, you know, the process, the learning, both on the part of the teacher and the students is a process. Definitely, definitely, definitely. I mean, and um, <laughs> by the time we have learned all this, by the time we have more or less, because it's never 100 percent, we have more or less managed <laughs> and brushed up our skills, we retire. <laughs> so um not yet not quite yet <laughs> i'm about to but i will go on teaching i always say that this is what i love it's my passion and i think that's the key i mean if you still feel uh this passion if you enjoy being in the classroom that's the key to it all all right guys yes. okay uh, that was amazing we i could go on and on i, I, I could I listen know. to Alejandro we need to... talking about teaching all day long right Absolutely. that was amazing guys so thanks so much we did it we managed to get through this uh intense fast forward session a special thanks to Luis for staying up so late for us on the other side of the world we really and sorry appreciate for that. going over 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 time right. i i i i think i think i'm a bit like alejandra when i start yeah i i forget um, i think we're all like that and, yeah. and, and special thanks to everybody that stayed up really late to watch this as well. Special thanks to Alejandra for uh, doing two sessions for us uh, yeah. in, in one fast, two, two topics yeah. in one session. That was amazing. That was a pleasure. Lot of work. A pleasure, yeah. really. And let me really a special brilliant. award for you on your timekeeping because that was amazing. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well done. Yeah, well done, guys. Well done. <laughs>